Let me see what we've got. Okay. Um, as far as points, if you are used to using points and you have your system set for inches, you can always go ahead and type in PT. So again, if you're used to typing in in an old version of software, uh, first of all, you can work in points if you want. That's perfectly up to you. Honestly, I don't have a conversion chart in front of me, so I don't know what two points converts over to. Um, again, you can look at a conversion chart. If you're used to running in points, you can either set your system for points or you can always type in PT at the end of it and the software will convert it to inches. So again, like I said, if you're, you can either set your system back two points. So the same thing when you're looking at your zigzag densities and that kind of thing, you can set your system back to work in points if that's what you're used to, it's fine. Um, most of the customers do not run in, um, in the metric system. So we do go ahead and teach the class in inches. But again, you are welcome to set your system to whatever you want. Yes, points is metric. So points and millimeters are both metric. So stitches per inch is the one that is going to be the true inches for that. So SPI is the inches. Any questions before we jump in here? All right. So we're going to actually walk through going ahead and looking at all of those different items. So let's go ahead. And you know what? I'm going to reset this because I closed one of my windows that I need open. So we are going to go in here and restore my default workspace. And we're going to close this and reopen it. That's what happens when I click too many buttons. I do the same thing everybody else does and close windows that I needed. There we go. That's what I needed back. So I'm going to go ahead and just deliberately click new so that there is nothing set up here. So there's absolutely nothing set as far as any of our systems. So let me go back in here. And change my units back. I reset my whole system before because I was helping somebody with something. So I am resetting it back. So I'm going to start off with the word normal. Because when you go ahead and you hit that button, and it just opens up a blank design, it puts you in what's called the normal recipe, which means that there are absolutely positively no settings in here. So we're going to go ahead and duplicate the word normal. So I'm going to come up here to duplicate, left click to place it, and then hit our enter key. I'm going to change this to density. Now to change my density, I'm going to go to the satin tab. And right here, you can see it says 0.0 SPI. So I'm going to change this to 10. Again, it's going to add 10 stitches per inch. 
So that's what it's doing right there. So then what I'm going to do is I am going to duplicate the word density. Left click to place it. Hit your enter key. So I'm going to change the word density to pole comp. Once I change the word density to pole comp, then what we're going to do is go into the compensation tab and I'm going to go to absolute and I'm going to make that 0 0.02. So again, you can definitely see that there's a difference even on the screen between the word normal and the word pull comp. So then I'm going to take that word pull comp. I'm going to go back here to duplicate. Left click to place it. Hit my enter key. I'm going to change pull comp to underlay. So I'm going to come over here to my underlay tab. My underlay tab, there it goes. I'm going to hit the contour and the zigzag and turn that on. So like I said, you can tell, even on a screen, that there's a difference between normal and underlay. Now where you can really tell is going to be in the actual... It's going to actually be in the actual stitches themselves. So let me get my stitch out here. So this is the sew out. So when you're looking at this, it is not that the word normal doesn't sew. I know everybody thinks that the software is that smart. The software itself is only as smart as the person behind it. Um, it does whatever you tell it. So if you start every design with normal and you don't change anything, it's not going to know what to do. It, it's doing exactly what you tell it to do. So for those of you who are new, I don't expect you to memorize everything I just said. That's why the recipes are there for you. So if you picked a recipe for this, it would put all that in for you. But I'm sure if you as the customer, if you're looking at so else, you would probably much rather your name look like the word underlay does than the word normal. Again, this kind of looks like it's pulling, and again, it is. You haven't adjusted it for that texture in the fabric. So it's pulling at those stitches. Again, it's not giving it a little bit of lift, lift off of there. It is not going ahead and making those stitches a little wider to adjust for that pull. So again, that is the whole purpose behind all of those settings. It's to make your design look better. Now, if you hit blank design, it does not remember anything that you did. So anytime you just hit blank design, it puts up the normal recipe. There is absolutely positively no pull comp, no density, no underlay. So it starts from scratch every time. So that's why we said if you are starting a new design and you are unsure. So when you say file new, instead of hitting blank design, if you go to that new design wizard and hit OK, you will be able to scroll up or down and select from those recipes. So again, if you're new and you don't know what to put in there, then that would be my suggestion for you. Um, as far as like right now, I have multiple lines, so it depends on how you put your multiple lines up. So again, this obviously has different settings than this. So as long as the items are separate pieces, they each have their own properties. So as long as you have put them up separately, as far as multiple lines of text, then they can be changed.
Now, when you are in multi-line, you will notice that there is an option that it will break the text into separate lines. Again, you can do that. It's an option. So you can still use that multi-line feature, except that it's going to put them into different lines. Yes, if you put a box around a bunch of things. So if I were to put a box around everything and change something, it would change everything. So for instance, if I just came in here and something simple, we change the font. So it changed the font for everything. Right, they still kept the settings for each one. So the only thing that I personally change for everything right now is the font. Any setting that we had here, it still kept that setting for that piece. So like the word underlay still has all of those things. So that didn't change. Okay. Now you do in your materials section. So again, if you have not downloaded your materials, you do want to make sure that you do that before the end of the webinar. So you can use the link off of your email or in your control panel, it says materials. So in there, you do have uh, the sew out. So if you want to sew it, so you can go ahead and it is called, what is it called? settings.pxf. So for settings.pxf, that's what I had on my screen before I changed the font. And you could sew that out. Just make sure you sew it out on something that has a little bit of a texture and is stretchy. Let's see what else we've got here. Right. So unless I went in and changed the physical recipe, like I went in here and I put totally separate things for each item. So unless I change an overall recipe of everything, all it did now when I highlighted it is change the one thing that I changed for every one of those. Um, grouping together doesn't make a difference. They're still technically seen as separate entities. Um, it's just they move as one. The only time that that would be different um, is like, let me just take normal for a second. So I don't want to change everything in case we have questions there. So if I select normal, I right click and I go to apply style. If I had multiple things set up that way, if you go ahead and select something, it's going to change all of the settings. So if I were to come in here and let's say I go to towel, for instance. So if I go to the towel recipe on that word normal, it's going to keep the font because the recipe is not affecting the font unless you go to reset. If you reset it first, then it does change the font back. Um, so if you go and select a recipe, so I select towel for this. Now it's gone in and you'll see as you start to go through. So it didn't change my density, but it added a 0.01 absolute pull compensation. And it is also added a contour and a zigzag underlay. Okay, so it depends on what you have selected. Does anyone have any other questions? All right, so the next thing that we're going to do is go in, I'm going to start another file, and we're going to start to go through uh, what we used to call um, the, the transformation settings. Again, they still are under the right-click menu as transform, but again, one of the new things that the software did is put them above in the ribbon interface. So I'm going to put my name up here. <clears throat> so for those of you who had the older versions of software and you still like right clicking, if you right click and you go to transform, all of these are still here. 
So you did not lose anything. It's just that Pulse likes to give you other ways to do it. And I tend to not want to be right clicking all the time. So you're going to find that a lot of these things are now up here on that interface. So we've already used duplicate, but we'll go ahead and review it anyway. So when we go to duplicate, you're going to see I can left click to place these, hit the enter key to process. So when you're using duplicate, it is making exact duplicate copies of whatever was in the box. It might be a name, it could be a name and a design. Whatever it is that you had in a box is what it's duplicating. Now, the difference between duplicate and the next one is the fact that Pulse starts to mention the word power. So anytime Pulse mentions the word power, I guarantee it's doing more than one thing at a time. So with the case of power copy, I can left click on it. And the first thing I have to do is click and drag on whatever's in the box to identify what becomes what we call the pivot line. So I'm going to click and drag from the top of my name. Oops, I guess it helps if I get to this. So we're going to go power copy. There we go. Left click and drag. And that becomes my pivot line. So we're going to go somewhere I have space. So you can see when you're in power copy, you can actually duplicate, resize, and rotate all at once. Now, if you are holding your control key while you're clicking and dragging, it's allowing me to duplicate and rotate, but not resize. And if I hold the alt key while I'm clicking and dragging, I can duplicate and resize, but not rotate. Okay. Again, if you hit your enter key, it is going to generate those. So the next one, so let's go ahead and select one of these. The next one is our power edit. And again, I know some of you who have the higher levels of software, you have other things up here. Again, we are getting into the ones that are going to affect every level of software. So things that might be up here in that edit toolbar, if we're not covering them, we'll cover them in one of the higher level classes. So it would either be in your advanced lettering or one of your digitizing classes. So we're going to go over here to our power edit. So when you're in power edit, you're going to notice that all of a sudden you've got all of these dots around the box here. Again, like we said, it could be around a name. It could be around any of the items in the box. So again, if you have multiple things, same box comes up. So very similar to how the center dots work on text. This is allow you to take multiple items and you can slant them. This one over here is rotate. Again, if you're watching that bottom left hand corner, it is keeping track of how much I rotated and that kind of thing. Then you have your different resizing. So you can see we can resize proportionally. We can resize disproportionately. Again, to get out of this tool, you're going to go back to your select arrow. So you can either come over here and click on it or it is the letter S on your keyboard. So the next one we're going to look at is reflect. So reflect is mirror image. Again, it's going to be backwards. So when you come in here and you click reflect, you are going to see three columns. So the three columns of that very first one is what we call an arbitrary axis. So wherever you click and drag from, is where it's going to reflect from. Then we have our center column, which is allowing you to flip left or right. Just to remember, it is always flipping over the heavy dark line. Then we have our last column, 
which is going to allow you to flip up or down. Now you do have an opportunity to copy the reflection. So when you hit copy reflection, your original is going to stay intact and only the copy is going to change. So I'm gonna click over here on arbitrary, click my copy reflection. When I click okay and I start to click and drag on my screen, See how it lets me go ahead and even do this at an angle. So my letters are backwards at whatever angle that I drew. So let's say I want to flip these above here. So I can go back to reflect. I'm going to go ahead and I want this to be above. So I want the heavy dark line to be above it. I'm going to hit copy reflection. Click OK. So now it flipped it above here. So now if I select these and I want these to go to the right. Again, I can go to reflect. Copy reflection. And I want the heavy dark line to be on the right. Okay, so that is your reflect. Now, as far as the way this ribbon bar is working, because um, I know it gets very confusing. So right now I have nothing selected. So when you look up here, you are seeing the overall width of the entire design. It's showing me the master density and everything else. It's just like coming over to the flyout for design properties. The only thing extra that design properties is giving you is a stitch count. Okay. So again, same concept over here. Now, if we select something, so let's say I select these items on my screen. So what you're going to find then is that when you are in here, you are going to see the size of what is in the box. So right here, it says that this is 15.61 in width. So if you want to change the overall width, let's say you want to change this to 10. I can type in 10. So you can see it changed it proportionally. So while the, the lock is locked, it is doing it proportionally. If you unlock it, then you can change that disproportionately. Same thing up here with rotate. Whatever is in the box, if you want to rotate it, so let's say you want to rotate this 45 degrees, you can type in 45, and it's going to rotate at 45 degrees. Now, if you want to move something, so whatever's in the box, if you want to move it instead of clicking and dragging like I just did, again, remember X is going to be horizontal, Y is vertical. So if I want to go ahead and start to move it to the left, that's down, so it's a negative. Here's to the right. This is allowing us to move down or up. Now you could type. So if you want to type instead of using the arrows, you can go ahead and do that. Does anyone have any questions on that? All right. So the next thing that we are going to look at, so we're going to do one more exercise before our break. So we are going to edit the true type font exercise that we created in Embroidery Essentials Part 1. So I'm going to go over here to open and pick our true type design. So we said when we have a true type 
that we can go ahead and make any changes that we want. So if it doesn't come in here correctly, because remember these are auto digitized as a satin. So when they're auto digitized as a satin, how you do this is really going to be based on how much work you have to do. So let's go ahead. This technically you could sew out with no problem. Okay. So technically you could sew this out with no issue. I am a little bit picky about the way the top of this A is. So I want to do two things. I want to make this section a different section and then change the actual um, direction the stitch is going in. So we always look at two different things when we are either digitizing or fixing something that is digitized. So we are going to first look at, oops, there we go, the angle line tool. So I'm going to grab the angle line tool first. So see here with your angle lines, these are actually stitch direction lines. So I want to get rid of the one that's up here because I don't want it to turn anymore because I'm going to actually divide this into a different section. So I can right click here and hit delete. And then to make this a separate section, I'm going to come over here to what's called a virtual slice and click and drag. So if I have minimal work to do, then I'm going to go ahead and leave this as text. If I've got a lot of work to do, then sometimes I have to go ahead and convert this from text to segments. So for now with this one, and we're going to not convert it till the next exercise. So with this one, I can go ahead and let's go back. So I'm going to start off with virtual slices. The S is fine, so we're going to leave it. You can see how funky that this is sectioned off. So first of all, I can come in and just move this. Move this. Then I can swing this one over. Hit generate. So now I'm going to divide this up here. So again, left click and drag. Hit generate. So now I have to go back in and change the angle lines. Angle lines are stitch direction lines. Again, when it auto digitizes, it loves to add tons of these. So I'm going to start to get rid of some of these. So right click on it, hit delete. I'm going to actually delete this one. You really don't want your slice lines butted up against your angle lines. So like this guy down here, kind of funky. down here is kind of funky. So this one we don't need either. So sometimes you can either move them by clicking and dragging or just delete them. G for generate. Again, make sure you're regenerating. If you're not regenerating, you're going to move the same point or angle line or whatever you're moving 10 times before you realize it was fine. Get No, you don't really need this one if, like, if you don't want to turn it. So see how it's changing that direction? Sometimes there really is too many of them. So you really don't need any more than one on a straight section. If you have a curve, you're going to need multiples to get around on the curve. So I'm going to come back here and get my virtual slice. Let's move this down. I'm going to grab this guy here, move it down. Let's 
Once I've gone ahead and done that, I can go back to my angle lines. I tend to delete ones I don't want. It's just a lot easier. Hit generate. Now we come over here to our eye. Again, let's go back to our virtual slices. And guess what? It doesn't have any. So there are no serifs on here. So you really don't want it to sew out like this. So you can click and drag here. Click and drag here. Now we have to go into our angle lines. Again, this is actually crossing the slice line. That's why it's not filling in. So I'm going to bring it down so it's not crossing the slice line. Straighten this up. Hit generate. Let's go back to our virtual slice. So this one does not need to slice that far over. I'm going to click and drag and make a serif here. Click and drag and make a serif here. Again, let's hit G for generate. Then we're going to go ahead and go to our angle lines. And like I said, if there's one that just is not working out, Sometimes it's easier to delete them than it is to move them around. So angle lines are stitch directions. Virtual slices are what's dividing that into sections. So it's making that a serif or whatever it is that you are doing to create that shape. Again, if you're in doubt, you can always hit G at any point and then decide if you still want to if you still want to edit anything. Does anyone have any questions so far? Um, in this case, I wouldn't have left this. That would have sewed really funky. Again, you should only run into issues like this if you're doing a true type and converting it to satin pad. Any of your regular embroidery fonts, you shouldn't have to fix anything. So with your regular embroidery fonts, you should not have to change anything about them. But when you are converting your true type fonts, to a satin path. Again, it's an auto digitized feature. So those are cases where you might need to go in and make those changes. All right, so what we wanna do is we are going to let you take a 10 minute break. We are going to get into some more outline editing in our next exercises. So again, if you do have any questions during the break, feel free to post them in the chat box. This one I did not convert. You can. You can convert them from text to segments, but in this case we could make these changes that we needed to with these without doing it the next couple exercises that we do there's some more intensive editing to it so we have no choice but to convert them from text to segments 
So it really depends on what you're trying to do. So let's go ahead and give you that 10 minute break. Again, like we said, if you have any questions during the break, feel free to post them. Again, we will see you in about 10 minutes. 